Okay. So, yeah, be before Carlos um, introduces our last speaker for today, um, we just wanted, and we don't have time, obviously, to do a roundup of what we just experienced in the, uh, in the discussion sessions, um, but that's good. We're, we don't, you know, that's less work for us right now. But we will um, compile uh, in the proceedings. We will have a summary of what went on, a discussion of what we uh, saw in the two sessions. Um, I did want to. We do want to say one, one or two things. Uh, one uh, is that, well, I think we failed miserably because we, from what I understand, uh, uh, from what happened up here and, and what I saw happen downstairs, because our objective, our, our the trick with this theme was to avoid talking again about how we're all so different in Europe. You know, we said, well, instead of having for the 40th anniversary, um, a, you know, a, a, dis a discussion, a comparison uh, uh, of everything that's different amongst us, let's kind of divert, it's kind of a trick, we'll divert um, the point of view and we'll ask everyone to talk about what they're doing elsewhere. And that way, maybe we'll find a lot of stuff in common. And I think we did. But in the, in the open sessions uh, here and downstairs just earlier, what happened? Well, we saw again, uh, we realized how different the context is in each country, the institutional context, the relation with uh, the rest of the world, the uh, economic context, the political context, uh, you know, talking about Brexit, even we, downstairs, someone even brought up Donald Trump. I mean, so, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, we came back to that. What, what divides us in a way? But that's okay, because I think that, uh, and again, as an outsider, we're both non-European from origin, but we've, we're adopted Europeans. Uh, that is obviously, and I know this sounds a little bit bateau, as we say in French, or a bit c contrived, but the, there is a real richness in the d diversity. The important thing is to always contextualize, to be uh, critical about it, and to understand how those differences determine all sorts of things, but how they can also be, uh, by sharing those differences, we can each figure out how we can act better uh, between each other and, and with the rest of the world. So it's, in a way, there was a little bit of a failure at the end, but it is also, I, I think, a real success. Um, I do, I, uh, just now, uh, a couple of words of thanks um, to all of you for the great effort to communicate in English and to uh, under, try to understand French uh, when you could. Um, I actually didn't know that the association had two official languages, so I just assumed that everything would be in English. So uh, it's important to note that uh, that effort for all of you to communicate in the language of a country that has decided to leave Europe. Oops, did I say that? Um, the European Union, but we're not talking about the European Union, we're talking about Europe as an idea. Um, as a community of, of, of thought uh, and, and, uh, and values um, that extends all the way to, uh, to Turkey and beyond somehow. Um, uh, it's a great effort uh, and uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, I also want to, of course, thanks, thanks again to the uh, association, to the board, to Martin. Thank you to Delphine Gray Dumas, I don't know if she's still here, the director of studies at the school who uh, helped um, organize a lot of today, to Christophe Monté, who works on communication uh, for uh, the direction of studies, and again to Melanie Kovas, uh, who's the events and uh, public relations manage manager who did way more uh, than uh, her job description in making uh, today happen, and the next few days as well. Um, uh, voilà, so those great thanks. A uh, big round of applause, Ali, for all of them. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Kent. So uh, I had the honor and the pleasure to present uh, my friend uh, Darko Radovic. Uh, he's a friend of our school because he's a, a coordinator of the program BNB, Bangkok, Melbourne, Bordeaux. Uh, with Catherine Wolf from Melbourne, uh, Claire Parin from uh, Bordeaux, and David Boram uh, from Catherine University in uh, 2003, uh, the three year program. Uh, Darko is professor of architecture and urban design at Keio University and initiator on a founding co director of International Keio Institute for Architects uh, and Urbanism, and a visiting professor at the United Nations University Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, Yokohama. 
Uh, he was a member of the Philip Center for Health and Wellbeing in Livable, Livable uh, City Think Tank uh, 211 and 230. Uh, Darko Radovic received uh, his doctorate in architecture and urbanism from the University of Belgrade, Yugoslavia. Uh, he has taught uh, research and practice in architecture and urbanism in Europe, Australia, and Asia. Uh, his research in architecture and urbanism, uh, and consequently the core of activities in his laboratory, focus at the nexus between environmental and cultural sustainability. And situations where architecture and urban design overlap, where traditional architecture and urban styles blur, uh, where social start to acquire physical form. Um, his investigations of the concepts of urbanity and sustainable development focus on culturally and environmentally diverse contexts which expose difference and offer encounter with the other. Um, well, Darko, uh, is a professor teacher of Keio University, as I said, the uh, University of Tokyo, of Tokyo, the University of Melbourne, the University of Belgrade, uh, and the Center for the Planning of Urban Development of Belgrade. Uh, well, uh, he made a lot of uh, publications, including Green City, uh, Urbophilia, a Cross Cultural Urban Design, Another Tokyo, uh, Eco Urbanity. Uh, Small Tokyo uh, and well, other uh, books that uh, we can uh, uh, speak with Adarko uh, after the, this conference. And well, uh, Darko, please, uh, I invite to to the this uh, uh, last keynote speaker. Thanks. Thanks. Carlos already told you all, so I can just confirm some of these things, not everything. Well, thank you very much uh, for staying uh, until the end. Uh, this is a not very good moment because between dinner and you, only I stand. Only positive thing is bet that between my dinner and <laughs> only this lecture stands. So uh, I can't afford to be like Fidel Castro and go forever. Uh, but uh, Fidel Castro is a kind of partly in design of this lecture because uh, it is long. Uh, I was exchanging several emails with Carlos, uh, to whom I thank for this kind invitation. Uh, in order to make um, this fit the, the occasion. And because this uh, presentation concludes the day, as you will see, it is quite unusual. Uh, I got used to Japanese sleeping during lectures. That is national, national sport. But um, if I see more than 50% sleeping, that means uh, I'm overdoing it and I will finish then. Lecture is designed as a kind of sausage which can be cut in various ways. So at some moment, uh, if any, Oh, well, I will see. I will see. I will put my glasses. So let me now begin. So yes, uh, I teach architecture at urban design at Keio University in Tokyo. Um, and uh, this is me in Japan. So this is my name, Darko, Darako, in Japanese. So my lecture is, my presentation is going to be very much about that. I uh, thank uh, the School of Architecture and uh, Landscape Architecture from Bordeaux, Carlos and Claire Farhan and others for inviting me. because. Uh, I must tell you, I had really problems putting this together because I speak to special audience and discussions that I attended are really interesting. So I speak to like-minded people with rich experience. So it is very difficult to talk about something that would not be saying the obvious, which would not be repeating something that is common knowledge in this group. That is what I was thinking about when I was putting this sausage together. So uh, I will try to be... Uh, uh, I will try to present very much to focus on my own personal experience, and I hope that that can provoke some discussion. So I entitled my paper responding to this title of the conference, Relearning, but like regarding learning, uh, but also relearning. Uh, as relearning, uh, reteaching maybe, rethinking uh, architecture and urbanism in and for cultures which are different from our own. Um, in abstract, uh, I have put this, uh, that I will refer to and reflect upon some of my own experiences of immersion into diverse teaching and learning environments. Uh, as Carlos said, uh, when people usually ask me where I'm from, I have to say I'm from the past. I'm from what used to be Yugoslavia, a country which doesn't exist anymore. In 1990s, I moved to Australia. I traveled on Australian passport. I worked in uh, Asia, East, Southeast Asia. Uh, now I'm somewhere on one beach in, 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 in Tokyo, and I hope that these Greenpeace are not going to 
come and save me, to throw me back to the sea as they do with whales, and uh, make me keep on swimming again. And I decided uh, to put these little arrows in, uh, in some parts of my slides to indicate to you that that would be something where I would like to talk more about. And if you want to pitch your questions somewhere there, I would be grateful. Although I don't think there will be time for questions because of that dinner. Um, so my special emphasis will be on Japan. And that is really something that I'm privileged to be able to communicate to you because we just heard uh, EU, Europe wants to extend beyond Turkey. So Japan is beyond, beyond Turkey and I'm speaking at this, at this conference. Uh, it is really a rare experience, a perspective of a foreigner who is inside the system. Very unusual. And I must say, I, feel, uh, I felt flattered when I first uh, was received as a first foreigner professor at the faculty uh, that was of uh, urban design and planning at the University of Tokyo. And then after that at K University with my own laboratory. So it is an interesting perspective because that is a culture, I mean, all cultures are closed in their own ways, but Japanese culture is very, very hermetically closed. So it's very interesting to have that inside view. Uh, so uh, in 2006, from 2006 to 2008, I was at the University of Tokyo at the uh, Center for Sustainable Urban Regeneration. And then I returned to University of Melbourne, where before that I spent 16 years. And an uh, invitation from K University came, which was irresistible. So at K University, I inherited a laboratory of Kengo Kuma, whose contract was expiring. He was there for 10 years. And I established my laboratory, which in French doesn't sound very good, Collabo but it really indicates something that I will mention a little bit later. So I became a resident of Tokyo. I became embedded, as it is popular to say, since the since first Iraq war, I think, uh, in, in that situation which I'm interested in. So uh, both experiences actually deny routine, and that is what I want to communicate to, the, to you. They demand constant rethinking of fundamentals even of the subject, which is as old as subject that we are dealing with in architecture. So that is my fascination, and that is what I would like to share with you. And uh, I would like, my task here, I understood, was to broaden discussion after two days of concrete discussion to zoom out. And that is what I will try to do in this presentation, and I will mention, I have to mention that word, globalization, which we have discussed and which we need, need to discuss. So immersion, immersion, internal perspective, and also my aims are to celebrate diverse situated knowledges to point at the risks inherent to any foreign intervention, I say, even when carefully and best intended. And that is where I put this red mark because I know that some of you will want to bite at that and I would love to have that. Because I want this paper also to be polemological. That is Michel Desserteau's term, which I like very much because he wrote how polemological thinking is about forcing theory to recognize its limits. It's not me, but it is us. It is our experiences of working with the other which could do that, which could have capacity to do that. And of course, it is shamelessly personal. It is presenting personal experiences, my own position, and thus it is subjective. We did this book, which was about recontextualizing various ways of uh, doing uh, research in Hong Kong, Bangkok, Singapore, Tokyo, and some other places. So in immersed, internal, subjective, but what about examples of work, uh, Japanese ways, keys to success, etc. cetera? That, is, that would be another talk. And that would be another many talks. That is what fascinates me there. What are the secrets? Are there secrets to Japanese undeniable success in the field of architecture? We all have our, famous, our favorite Japanese architect. What is there? Again, I have to leave that for one of these arrows because that really opens too much. What I have to focus today is on the ways of thinking and being not with the other, but being the other. And I will now expand on that. So this is regarding K University, regarding my laboratory, reg regarding ICI, that International K Institute for Architecture and Urbanism that Carlos mentioned, and something that is in the making. As we speak, we are, we are working, do doing, I think, final touches on something that will be new graduate program, KO Architecture. Because the oldest university in Japan, KO, never had faculty of architecture, department of architecture. They are always within very strange, Japanese love those interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary environments. So architecture at KEO is distributed between faculty of science and technology, where I suffer, and faculty of uh, media and governance, which is a very unlikely place to seek architecture, but yes, they are there. So, but ultimately, as I said, selfishly, self-indulgently, uh, because I speak about my own experiences, it is really about showing what I have learned there with this, trans with this transition from Darko to Darako Radovici. Uh, I will invite later uh, 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 
Claire was kind of criticizing me yesterday, you know, referring to Roland Barthes, who I was quoting a long time ago, so I had to in insert this image, and say, learning with the world. First, I have to say why me, why I think I'm here. Because if it is regarding learning with the world, it is regarding BMB, and Claire already mentioned a lot, so I can be faster with this segment of my presentation, which was very important to me. So in 2002 to 2005, we have conducted three uh, workshops, as I will show later. These are, orig these are photos from that time. So here you can see Claire, and you can see some other suspects. Where this is when Carlos was coloring his hair black. Um, and um, <laughs> me too, kind of half-half. White was not fashionable yet. Sejima and Sana brought that in, you know, those Japanese. It was a collaborative international project where we had these three workshops. Uh, first one was in Bangkok, second one in Melbourne, third one here in Bordeaux. That itself is a fascinating experience because we were trying really to mitigate with problems which we are still discussing. Equality, travel. So we had some solutions which made us all, at least in economic terms, equal within this project. And then we had two symposia. First one was in Bangkok just before we started, and the second one was the symposium here in Bordeaux, which produced this book, Cross-Cultural Urban Design. Um, many of us, including Catherine Bull, my colleague from University of Melbourne then, and me, uh, were talking about that. C Catherine came uh, to University of Tokyo when I was there, and we were presenting it together. So in order to open this, I will show to you, this was uh, from the final paper presented in this same city in 2005. BNB was already becoming behind us. It, it, it was possible to tell the history of BNB, what we have learned. And for me, was becoming important. That understanding of subjectivity and importance of subjectivity is very important. We are subjective. We cannot avoid our subjectivity. We can only avoid saying and admit our subjectivity. So it is always, always, already there, already there. I'm really sorry for this. This morning, uh, because these are slides which I copied from then, and then for some reason I liked Skia font and it was red. So I have just pasted here, but this morning I couldn't read the thing, so I will be very fast with this because I know now you can't read the thing. But I will try to read it for you. Uh, it was work together, not despite, but because of the differences, at war, of course. And what was fascinating there was that it was a trialogue. You can see the key words there at the bottom. So it was not usual binary opposition, but it was very much following one of the great, in my opinion, French thinkers, urban thinkers, Henri Lefebvre, uh, it was, um, who was consistently sought to crack the binary oppositions, open by introducing an other term, the third possibility of moment, etc. So our project, partly accidentally, was like that. It was a trialogue. And as in Lefebvre's method, the BMB threading uh, recomposes the dialectic through the intrusive dis disruption. That intrusive disruption was very interesting because there was always the third. When Thais and us from Australia were discussing something, there were French there behind. When we and French were gossiping something about Thais, then, you know, Thais were the third. So there was always the third, which usually is missing there. And third is a corrective force, whatever we were speaking about. It was not about French and Australians going to the third world, to, the, to Thailand. It was about, in Thailand, doing it Thai way, in Melbourne, doing it Australian way, or Melbourne way, in Bordeaux, doing it French Bordeaux way in our project. And that was fascinating for me, that discovery of, an, of another other, but disturbingly, me as the other. I also found myself being seen by two pairs of different cultural lenses as strange one, as different one. So, um, BNB uh, was very interesting because uh, as a critique, it opened to thinking many of these things which I don't want to torture you with these red letters anymore. I use this in my paper, I use a famous painting uh, by Salvador, Salvador Dali painting his gala, in which he included himself. Uh, so, and um, Robert Dale, one of the uh, authors to whom I will come back later, was speaking that it is very important to have ability to learn how to let go how to let be penetrated by the new and the different, to accept the otherness of the other. And that was that very, very important thing here. Precious moments in which one can grasp not only a stranger as a stranger, as um, uh, Vochton would say, but also bring, to uh, bring to forward the experience of his or her own foreignness. And that is something that I almost, it was a foresight, something that will start haunting me very soon, our own foreignness. So in our book, Cross-Cultural Urban Design, 
due to copyright, of course, there was just cheating a hand sketch of uh, Dali, not uh, Dali, so we didn't have to ask all the permissions and everything else. And that was one of the most important things. Dali, who, as, as opposed to Van Eyck, uh, caricaturizes himself. He be beautifully paints beautiful gala, but he is a little bit caricatural. He looks at himself, he develops opportunity, he develops ability to look at himself with a kind of cynical smile. Oh, have a look how I look. And that is how I look in Japan, and that is how you, you, I used to look in Thailand without maybe being aware of always that I'm the strange one. In 2002 actually was the most important moment for me here. Davisi Buntam, who is not here, my colleague, colleague and partner in life, and I, we started exploring uh, and celebrating cultural difference by trying to work across those really interesting, huge, huge uh, differences in the first, on the first glance. So we were speaking about East and West and the issue of difference. And uh, my questions, which you can't see here then, were are Western analytical methods, methods directly applicable to the East? Or does otherness of Oriental cultures preclude their implementation? Are research and design methods so culture specific that they belong only to the cultural context that they have shaped? Of course, many of these questions are rhetorical, but they are coming back. We had them in this discussion we just ended in this room. So, and then most importantly, the issue of translat translatability. One of my subtitles, as if I knew what is installed for me, was translation of the untranslatable. Quoting Antoine Bergman, who said, translation has to be grounded in the desire to open up the stranger as a stranger to his own space and in his own language. And that is different, that is difficult. So it was about translation uh, and in translation, it is the space between cultures and languages that is most interesting and the area that we should address. It is the zone of uncertainty, the zone of reflexivity uh, and self-questioning in which we have the experience of otherness. And the otherness is not only difference and distance from other, other culture we are studying, but also from our own culture. And that, of course, comes to that, you know, when we want to go to, to Thailand or to south something or to east something and to teach people how to design a lecture room so that it can be darkened so that the audience can see the slides. We have to teach them how to do it. They don't know. <laughs> they don't know. We have to export knowledge. So, and materials and everything else that goes with that. So, and so that is that fascination and I, I, I will stop torturing now with these slides and go to this. This was, I borrowed from, uh, Franco Ferrarotti's uh, statement. I decided I prefer not to understand rather than to color and imprison the object of analysis with conceptions that are in the final analysis preconceptions. Because we always bring baggage with us. And consciously or not, it is there. Consciously or not, we stereotype. Or uh, uh, François Julien, who says when exploring the, uh, cultures of, uh, the cultures and thought of the other, only crossing threshold and entering might be possible. So crossing, not crossing once, but keep on crossing, keep on entering, it might be possible. And I will come back uh, to, to Julian later because he is a very interesting translator of, uh, of uh, tra traditional Chinese texts, which are very, very important for all that we are speaking about, including Japan, of course. And today, Claire has put emphasis on process, and I was really very, very grateful because that is what Eminem was about. So after that, I dived in, I may have not learned much since, honestly, because that is why I'm showing to you these old slides, because that is something that I can only repeat. I can only repeat because those are kind of stepping stones into something that I am fascinated with. But I dive deep, and I'm long with air under the water there. I'm for a long time there trying to see, to trying to understand how fish breathe. Uh, first year after, uh, after BMB, I did this project in Melbourne. It was Dojo. It was leading towards uh, Tokyo, and it was about the uh, Hall for Martial Arts. And I quoted then, and this is, I promise, I forgot the last red quote. Um, a famous Japanese swordman, Musashi, said, there are not 36 ways of delivering a sword thrust. Um, uh, there is only downwards, upwards, from right to left, and from left to right. The man who knows these, stro these strokes uh, and does them well is a complete swordsman. So there is not too many ways. Tap, 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 tap. And if you are good at that, you are a good swordsman. But that doesn't mean that it is simple, not at all, because that is where our story comes in. 
It is about situation. It is about context. It is context in terms of time and place. We speak all too often as architects about place, about physicality of the context. But what about time? What about chronotope? What about time space? And that is where difference is coming from. So now, after this long introduction, I, with, with Francois Julien and Ferrarotti, uh, bring you to Nihon. So here is something that I will be speaking about uh, later a little bit, Japanese writing or ca Chinese writing. Japanese call it kanji, which means Han. Han way of writing. They honestly call their writing as, as, as Chinese. So uh, this uh, it, it means something like uh, the origin of the sun. So the name of the country, Nihon, is the origin of the sun. And I think for all of us who love design, the simplicity of this Nihon Maru <laughs> uh, is, uh, is perfect. So now Bart come, comes in. Um, and his book, uh, uh, The Empire of Signs. And that is what Claire uh, and I were joking about the other day. Because, and I, I, will, uh, I will elaborate on that in a moment. Uh, I was using a book by uh, Trifonas, who was writing about Bart and visualizing culture. And he, saw, he notices how, vignettes of Japan, how Bart uses vignettes of Japanese cultural life. The image as an icon of content. And that is very much the destiny, our destiny, inevitability for the stranger. When we travel, when we go somewhere else, that is what we get. We, we, we get images, we are trying to relate them to some contents, and Bart, Bart had to give up a logic and coherence uh, to his experience. So language, he said, language will always mediate understanding, and that is where Francois Julien comes in confirming that. For me, it is about connection, communication. Uh, sorry, this says con connection uh, because I'm using the example of bridge. Uh, without ability to speak local language, it is about discovering the ways to connect, the ways to communicate. So that is what we were doing in these projects in Asia, but also in my language, bridge is most. So establishing bridges. In Japanese language, it is basho. Same kanji in Chinese, of course, it is cho. In Thailand, it is sapan. So those are bridges, those are tools of communication. We need to find a way to communicate, a way to enter, as Francois Julien would say. Because a borrowed language is the language that we all speak, this uh, I, I unfortunate kind of uh, um, language that we all are using to communicate, always come with certain baggage, with certain cultural baggage which is unavoidable. So Trifona um, um, so, uh, says how those vignettes are dependent fundamentally on uh, language, which, as Martin Heidegger said in, te in, in, in uh, terms of bridge, is the place. The bridge is the place, place par excellence. You know that he explains that his, uh, the whole place theory was based on Heidegger's discussion of the river, which is no place. In nature, the river is not place. The place appears when we make a bridge, when we cross the river. So without the observer, there is no place. Without the observer, there is no meaning. Powerful, powerful thinking. Trifonas continues and he says, can we ever escape the ideology that colors perspective? And I think not, he says, and I agree. I don't think that it is possible to avoid that. So Barth engages neither in the construction or the mystification of Japan or its culture, uh, if such think, well, thinking was possible, Trifonos wisely uh, says. His critical move beckons us to acknowledge history and its representation of culture as an interpretative act. His own aesthetic vision of Japan, a semiological utopia where representations um, uh, a representation is not overfed by the Western imperative for meaning. And that is something that is fundamentally important. We seek meaning, we seek Heidegger, we seek being, uh, but at the same time as using the examples of Chinese culture and thousands of years of that culture, as Francois Julien says, that is one of our things, or that is one of our obsessions. Good example of that the alternative is possible is haiku, of course. And that is where I can refer to Matsuo Basha, probably the most famous Japanese haiku uh, poet. And he said, the ultimate authority, haiku is simply what happens in a given place at a given moment. Like Musashi, poof, poof. <laughs> That's it. That is what happens. It can have many, many, many interpretations, but haiku is that. A Japanese poet doesn't give meaning to that. He serves you with something that will in you, maybe in each of us, trigger different kind of meaning. And that is what, uh, what uh, Barth uh, picks on. He said, good haiku sets a bell ringing, triggering, as only possible remark, that's it. 
And that is what that does. Uh, any well-executed exec haiku, see, he says, sets the bell ringing inside us. And that is called kareji, or ah. So that is that moment when something feels good, or doesn't feel good, or whatever. There is no associated meaning immediately to that. It's about, as Japanese call, hara, for harakiri. But God's feeling in English, for instance. So, basho, old pond, frog, uh, frog, frog lapping, splash. Frog leaping. There are many translations of this haiku. This is in Japanese and this is in Japanese. So for us who cannot read kanji, we have only one privileged person here from China who can, is, you know, there is no meaning. Meaning is completely different for us who seek the meaning of the words. While there is something else. Something else is ah in that. So that is what Bart was seeking in a very, uh, presenting in a very interesting and elo eloquent, of course, way. Given that he is an outsider looking at in, into signs that both simplify and, and negate the possibility of an empirical Japan. That suspends the need to locate Japan in opposition to Western culture. However, he is not totally successful in avoiding naive or idealizations of Japanese culture. And this is the risk, risk he must take. All of us foreigners have to take such risks. So we are always mystifying, idealizing, looking down, looking up. There are always perspectives in what we do. So Bart, Bart in no way claims to represent uh, or analyze reality itself, those being the major gestures of Western discourse. Again, meaning, what does it mean? Fish, plop, what does it mean? Ask fish, ask frog, sorry. So instead we will isolate the certain number, he will isolate a certain number of features with which the system will be formed. Isn't that what we are doing with our students when we travel? Very much. We isolate several, several features and we try to give them some meaning. A system which I shall call Japan, said Roland Barthes. He was not pretending. He said for him it was about the body, of course, the face and the writing, what he was good at. For him, he was seeking Japan in what he was good at already. The domains of uh, the, the domains of other and metaphors for the presence or an absence of meaning or its progressive loss. And again, that is our destiny when we deal with those things. So flashes and insights into the complexity of representing the experiences of reality, the reality of experience. And that is where I come to one of my heroes who I mentioned already, Henri Lefebvre and his vécu, his lived experience, his emphasis on that. So. Um, Bart said nothing more or nothing less, and for Lefebvre that is that, lived experience, nothing more or nothing less. Today, today we were asking, you know, what is the purpose of architecture? Does artif architecture uh, find its essence in itself or in something else? No, it is about this. It is about quality of lived experience which unfolds in that what we create, at least in my opinion. And that is where Lefebvre was, of course, absolutely right. So I invited him to help me. So the University of Tokyo and Keio. Shibuya Crossing, maybe you know this place. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been in Japan, but this is one of the tourist spots. And the Japanese call it Skuramburu Crossing. Skuramburu is scramble in Japanese trans transcription. So Skuramburu Crossing is an interesting place. And I was trying to find many ways, oh, sorry, I'm behind the slides. Uh, I was trying to find many places to describe my immersion into that place, some of which worked, some of which haven't. But in this place and down, from the eye perspective, immersion becomes complete. And there was one moment, and that is what I really want to share with you because it was a significant moment for me. And I keep on coming back to this because it helped me start at the University of Tokyo or actually continue at the University of Tokyo and start at Keio. And that was this. Like an apparition, this amazing young woman appeared there in golden kimono and in that rush, that was Japanese call it mushin in martial arts, when you have a feeling that everything has stopped. Everything is so slow. You are operating in another time. So she was there, beautiful as you can see, immersed in the same space as I was, passing by. And I took my camera and took revenge for all Japanese taking photos in, on the Adriatic Sea when I was young, you know, sending us without Twitter and Facebook, bringing us back to Japan. Because it was strange. Uh, this apparition was strange to me. But then I realized something that is very important. Who is strangers am I, strangeness am I speaking about? Writing or speaking to you in this language which is not my own. Uh, a language which has capitalized I. I think English language is the only one which has capital I. 
So I speak in that language, even that capitalized I admits I am the stranger there. She is like a fish in the pond. She's maybe just the most beautiful fish. She's a golden fish at that moment, but she is in her element. I am the one who is odd. I am the other here. I am the radical other. I am the one who cannot decipher her at all, nothing on her. And recognizing that demands self-awareness, demands sensibility, demands responsibility, demands humility. We were mentioning some of these words in previous discussion. Now, asking, am I mystifying difference? Am I mystifying Japanese difference? Am I mystifying otherness? There is that book which I mentioned before, The Myth of Japanese U Uniqueness by Robert Dale, which I love to hate because it touches in me something that I don't like in me. So, but th these are questions are very important. Am I stereotyping or am I opening issues, which I would like to say that I'm doing, asking questions, for instance. And now I had to turn red because this is where I would really like some of you to turn red because this is where good questions are coming. And this is one of the things which keeps me in Japan with, and not repeating. For instance, the issue of public. I wrote uh, several years, eight, nine years, oh, not say that many, maybe six years ago, a paper which I entitled deliberately clumsily because my English allows clumsiness. It is unavoidable in my English. So uh, uh, the title of the paper was, they are telling me that in Japanese language there is no term equivalent to the Western concept of public. And that is true. There is no term for public in many languages, in global south and global east, where we go and where we make public spaces. But there is no term. And we know if we don't have a word for something, we probably, we never needed it. Probably we don't know, we don't have that. So that is the issue of paburiku. Like skuramburu crossing, scramble crossing. Public is paburiku in katakana. Is paburiku same as public? Is kokyo same as public? Kokyo is Japanese term. But kokyo, when you analyze these two kanji, means princely estate. So it is really something like privately owned public space, which is now a very popular surrogate. Is that public? Is Kokyo the same as public? Is Paburiku and Kokyo the same in, in Japanese minds? I discussed this with some of my favorite victims, my best friends in Japan, who survived my questions there. So that is an importance of definitions. Today, for instance, we were mentioning in, present in the first keynote address, I don't see if the colleague is here. It was very interesting, for instance, showing those settlements in northern Canada and using the term city. For me, it doesn't work. Definitions are very important. It is very important to speak in definite terms. It can be, depending on definition. But urbanity, city, that, that is a completely separate story which I would like to open. But w why would Kokyo be the same as public? Why would it? Some hundreds of years ago, in Rome and later, of course, in medieval Europe and all that, something that was developed two and a half thousand years ago in Greek, in Greece as Kinonia, developed, something that we started calling later public space, Respublica, etc. But at the same time, in China, there was Confucius. Two and a half thousand years ago, I'm sure Plato and Aristotle had no idea about Confucius, and Confucius had no idea about what was happening, some bearded people in some hot plaza in Greece shouting at each other. Different culture. So in his analects, he had different concepts. There is no concept like this. So. The question is, how could Kokyo be the same as public? There is no way it could be the same. Why is public considered universal? We know the answers, but the rhetorical questions are sometimes important. Or another conundrum, good for architects. How to say beautiful? Again, I have to ask, I have to use help of Francois Julien, compatriot of our hosts here who wrote a very, very interesting book, his, which is entitled in English, The Strange Idea of the Beautiful. Simply in Japanese language, there is no word beautiful. And my friends, colleagues from China and all that, and authoritative Julian explains that. It's very interesting. Greeks have complicated life and they developed abstract concept of the beautiful. We can detach that term from the object which is beautiful, from the person which is beautiful or something like that. In these languages, that is not done. Something is, something possesses certain quality which pleases us and is perceived as beautiful, but it is not the same. So, or for instance, how to say rights in Japanese language? Literally translated, right is power. So, I've, I stumbled upon this with, France, uh, with uh, Lefebvre again. 
a right to the city. How is it translated to Japanese language as power? Power of the city to the city, basically untranslatable. My Chinese friends tell me, of course, it's same, same in China. So when we speak as my former compatriot Slavoj Žižek, <laughs> like a Buddhist almost there, would say, you know, uh, human rights, who declares what are universal human rights? How can we declare that what we declare to be human rights, and it seems includes even free market economy, is universal? Who declares that? So one has to keep on asking, let me go back to my dark side. My, I just said my name has acquired an, another meaning in English language. Dark in my language has nothing to do with darkness. But you know, in English you see I go to these dark slides, oscillating between red and dark. So one has to keep on ans asking. And And Andrew Linde, Russian American uh, scientist, astrologist, asks these questions. He says, and I, I recommend uh, his writings, as I recommend of all these people that I'm putting there. He says it is very important to ask questions. We need new questions. And then he says we have to ask stupid questions. By stupid meaning simple questions. We have to go back from elaborate and complicated. We have to go to, whoosh, whoosh, to that kind of question. So in some of the research, which unfortunately I don't, don't have time to speak about, we were doing that in Tokyo. This is one of the books that Davisi and I did uh, and uh, this is an earlier one about uh, sustainability. This is about that uh, subjectivity in various uh, uh, cultural situations. So University of Tokyo, very interesting. And again, I'm trying, I hope, please don't understand this wrongly, that uh, I, I, it would be terrible if I talk about myself. I speak about the phenomenon of, of somebody who found himself the professor in Japan. So at the University of Tokyo, I was first. So it was becoming Radovich sensei. Radovic sensei. I was in Okata laboratory associated with this fantastic intellectual, Japan, famous Japanese urban planner, and he was my favorite victim at that time for all of these things. So sensei, etymologically means born before. So the word sensei, which is professor or which is respected person in general, indicates seniority, hierarchy, responsibility. So Radovic sensei. I was there in that, there was association, and I, I was Radovic sensei. So, and Okata, to explain to me what is that, was first to tell me, Darko-san, sensei is like a samurai. Like, wow, <laughs> we are overdoing it. I can use Musashi as a quotation, but not in practical terms. But then many, many, many Japanese colleagues in various places repeated that. And that means samurai who has responsibility towards those that he, and he, sexist, <laughs> is... Uh, responsible for, but of course also is responsible to those up. So that term, that word, embodies the power system, which is, which is Japan. So my passion is environmental and cultural sustainability never separated, always, always in one breath. So at the University of Tokyo, I produced these two books. One was entitled Another Tokyo, showing my fascination how wrong I was when I was visiting Tokyo many times before that as a tourist. And the other one was eco-urbanity, but I will focus only on this one because this was my first immersion, my first lived Japan. And I don't have time for that. I will leave it here again as one of these pointers that that leads somewhere. But then Keio. I left uh, back to University of Melbourne in 2008, but in 2009, invitation came from Keio. Uh, Keio, as I told you, uh, Kengo Kuma, my old friend, uh, was uh, leaving his position, and he had opportunity to go to his alma mater, the University of Tokyo. Japanese do that, like elephants, you have to go back. And, um, uh, but to go from Keio to the University of Tokyo, that is like transfer from Barcelona to Real Madrid or, or the other way around, unforgivable. So uh, as a token, he suggested that I inherit his laboratory. He didn't know what he was doing, I didn't know what I was doing. So that is how it happened. So Keio is the oldest Japanese university. I don't have time for many digressions, so, but... Uh, so this is the founder, uh, Yukichi Fukuzawa. He was one of those who with first Japanese ships after Japanese, Japan was really violently under threat opened. And if you read American Ultimatum from 1860 something, which is in Tokyo, Edo Museum in Tokyo, it says Japan needs to open its markets to American goods. <laughs> it sounds like 21st century, it was <laughs> much ahead. So, uh, so he was one of the, he was only 21 when he joined these illustrious groups who went to Europe and to US and he came back excited with the idea of university. He proposed that Japan needs university to go from Confucian thinking towards what he was calling uh, Western knowledge. And when I 
was appointed, which was a very strange story in itself. A colleague who was chairing, a head of department, told me, but darko -san, from now on, you always have to have a photo of the founder in your wallet. I think, oh God, where did I come? But then it turned out that his face is on 10,000 yen notes. So yes, yes, we all, we all do it in Japan. It was a very good joke. So that is what I find maybe as one of my bridges in Japan. I love to joke and they joke, they love to joke. So suddenly at K University, at K University the main center of which is very close to Tokyo Tower, I am the radical other. I am at this, uh, in this uh, faculty, in this campus over there in the top right corner with the red arrow, which is Faculty of Science and Technology. So I'm radical other both in that environment and in broader Japanese environment. So Department of System Design, how does chocolate bar crack? That is a digression which I have to mention to you. It happened to me four weeks ago. We had final presentation of some students and because department is incredibly interdisciplinary, uh, we have to listen to presentations from disciplines which don't speak only in a foreign language. They speak in an alien language of various niches of science and technology, which I wouldn't understand even if it was in my language. So, uh, one student stood up and she said, uh, she's uh, studying civil engineering, and she said, I'm investigating the cracks on chocolate bar. Very interesting in terms of chocolate. But what, how is that part of civil engineering? So in that laboratory, they are doing research for some Swedes company, how to have chocolate which will crack in various interesting ways, but not in that uncontrollable way where you end up with diagonally broken big part of, of, of your chocolate. So that is that disciplinary difference, a radical difference also. So um, Radovich is sensei established laboratory Radovich. Kuma son set, it, set me up for that and we are discussing that since then because it's fantastic experience. It is Kenkyu Shitsu Radovich. Kenkyu Shitsu means literally research room. Kenkyu is research Shitsu like in Chashitsu, tea room is the same term. This is how it is written in kanji. This is how it is written in hirakana. Japanese, if you don't know, have three ways of writing. Uh, kanji, ch Chinese, hirakana, and katakana. Kanji is traditional writing of this kind, which is Chinese, and Chinese can read it. Uh, hirakana is for, foreign, for new words, for neologisms. And uh, katakana is for these phonetic transcriptions or semi-phonetic transcriptions, uh, syllabic transcriptions of uh, foreign words, like rado, vici or Skuru and Brook Crossing. So, so I'm showing this to you just to say that what I call laboratory is variously seen as this, as this, as this. And my students call it Radoken. In the nature of Japanese language, Radovich Kenkyu Shitsu gets abbreviated to Radoken. So Radoken. I call it Kolabo. This is the view from my office. I'm privileged with this beautiful view of Mount Fuji, which happens only when the day is absolutely perfect. And illustration. The magnitude of challenge that I wanted to tell you about, the magnitude of challenge that I'm experiencing there. So entering Japanese Kenkyu Shitsu is like entering Japanese culture. It is a microcosm of relationships there. Uh, but being a head of Japanese Kenkyu Shitsu, really, and this comes after discussion with Kuma, Jinai, and many other of my Japanese colleagues, it's like being a father in the Japanese family. So what do you think about family? <laughs> looks at somebody like me as the father in Japanese family. So culture shock works both ways. And probably they are more shocked than I am. And that is one, what one has to be always with. So sensei, a Japanese professor, Japanese education is very traditional, although imported from the West. So it is about very, very slow progression. It's army, you know, you go from the soldier to your first and second and third until eventually you become or you don't become a general. So um, sen sensei is the guardian of the system. But sensei is the system. Uh, professor is somebody who has gone through all the steps in order to get there. But I have entered the system with a promise. I promised not to learn the language. And this is something that I, want, I would like to share with you because this is part of that statement, something that I learned when we were doing BMB. I don't want to fake it. I absolutely don't want to fake it. I don't want superficiality. When they asked me why, I said, well, probably I will never be able to read the books in Japanese language, which I really want to read. I have read Cinderella already, I know the plot. So why bother? Let's focus on where I might be good. So I was asking myself, why am I there? And that is that uh, recognition of the stranger, uh, uh, Anton, uh, what is his name, Berman. 
So recognition of the stranger as a stranger. I am a stranger. Please do recognize that in me. And let's work. Let's collaborate. Let's seek a bridge. So I am a stranger. And let's share that experience of own foreignness. My foreignness in front of you and your foreignness in front of me. My laboratory is very, very international. So it is not just Japanese students and me. So that is, we operate in English language, which is not mine, which is not there. And I always tell them, if English was my language, I would feel very, very bad about teaching in English. But because English is as foreign to you as it is to me. And when I was your age, probably I was not as good in English as you are now. I can shamelessly use this bridge to help us cross. It is 7 o'clock. Uh, Carlos, I'm finishing it. I can cut the sausage at any moment, so I'll just say that. So the experience of foreignness and this. The other, the different one, is vulnerable. That is what we have to be aware of always in these kind of environments. So the common response to that is arrogance, and usually the shield of an expert knowledge. I come there, I'm an expert, my degrees, diplomas, background, and all said that where I worked and what I did shows that I can make perfect lecture room. So I teach them how to make perfect lecture room for the sun, sunny day. And that's it. So that is an arrogance. But I'm not interested in that, because I really, honestly, otherness demands honesty. The worst thing is not to know what is behind the face that you cannot decipher. And I cannot. I cannot. I never will be. Otherness demands humility, responsibility, and these gestures are very, very important there. You know, Japanese culture is famous for refinement, for a fantastic array of gestures, which again, I can just scratch the surface of. But then you know that my skin is thick when it comes to those things. So they know. And five years into my term uh, at, uh, at Keio, they gave me this, a status of honorary alumnus of Keio. And it felt good. It felt good because, you know, you don't know if you are doing any good. So it is good when somebody nods the head. So what is Kenkyu Shitsu? This is how the structure system, this might look to you, interest you from technical terms. So uh, four years, two years master's, PhD, that is standard path there. In system design engineering, Riko Gaku first year, and in Japan in general, first year they consider to be a wasted year because they have those terrible high schools where if students don't commit suicides, then they enter the great university and everybody thinks that now they have deserved to take a breath. So first year, there is a huge emphasis on sports and all that, but that is not as funny as I'm trying to portray it. Japanese society is a group society. Some people call it beehive mentality. So those sporting associations, cult culture associations, art associations in the first year are there to develop bonds between students who will then, in groups, enter further studies. Because in Japan, basically, people very rarely use their first language, first uh, uh, name. It's always surname. So always surname. It is very impolite to use first name. And uh, to say I in Japanese language, the word is watashi. Even clumsy to keep on repeating watashi, watashi, watashi on the time instead of I, I, o, ya, um, whatever. So the first four years are undergraduate degree. Architecture appears here in some modest studios and then accelerates through electives in third and fourth year. So there are similarities with what you have. And then, of course, it continues into masters. But what is a big difference is that these specialized uh, laboratories, specialized laboratories which take external students, and through this channel, KO intake comes in. KO has primary school, junior high school, high school, and full university. So KO brand is very important. KO takes its own students all the way through. Maki Fumihiko uh, studied uh, high school at, uh, at uh, Keio. And after that, because Keio didn't have architecture at his time, he went to University of Tokyo. But now he's with us. He's 86 years old. And he's supporting us in this, what we are doing now, because he is, how it is called officially, Obi, old boy. He's Keio boy at the age of 86. And yes, he's very much boyish. So this is how it works. So in laboratory, the quality, if, as a promise, as I will come back later, because don't Understand me that I am mythologizing, idealizing this system far from perfect. There are, of course, many, many weaknesses. But what I want to speak about, what I promised in that uh, abstract, is laboratory system. As quality, as Kea wants to see as world class. And in many disciplines it is. So it is about research and research-led teaching. And that is very important. So it is, in my view, and this is just a diagram, really, like an academic ecosystem. Laboratories which... Uh, are incubators for top research, design research, and research-led teaching, as I said, and have a capacity for perpetual innovation. 
they are very insular. If we zoom in further, you see that each laboratory is headed by one professor. Uh, I put here just architecture, so Ban Shigeru, Kobayashi, Hiroto, few others of us. And so that laboratory, my laboratory, is my laboratory. Nobody tells me what to teach in my laboratory. I often use, and I will use my old joke with you, maybe, maybe Claire has heard it before, but literally. If I go, if I now not go, if I send email and I say, please prepare next semester, we will be doing cappuccino. We will be doing cappuccino. Sensei knows why. And that is that need for responsibility because it is such a level of control, such a, le such a scary level of control which I have all over those young kids that one really has to be alert, very, very alert to, to what is happening there. But that stays for further discussion. So this is where that happens, and then we have some parallel programs like summer schools, which through that Tiki we are organizing. As a digression, Davisi and I in 2010 with huge Sejima's push when she was director of Venice Biennale, at Biennale with Wang Shu and Hitoshi Abe and others have established Iki, that kind of non-existent, semi-existent, semi-virtual uh, institution which has produced lots of interesting research and some of the books which I have brought today, but they have disappeared. So, um, that gave some legitimacy to what is happening in the laboratory because in the ecosystem, yes, some strive, some prosper. So this project, three years long project, which was entitled Measuring the Non-Measurable, gave legitimacy to laboratories involved. So what is Ken Kyushitsu? It is like this. It is an opportunity. It is about trying and possibility to pull together various aspects of teaching and learning, and it is about power, continuity, hierarchy, inter interdependence, belonging. It is potentially about bottom-up multiplicity, but also it is inefficient, bureaucratic, autarkic, wasteful system. So it is like that, you know, it is not just, uh, for instance, just think about hierarchy. Well, is it bad always and a priori? Is continuity bad a priori or not? So I asked four people uh, when I was preparing for this to give me something to share with you. Uh, Hirano Toshiki-san is uh, an assistant of Kengo Kuma. So I asked Kuma, and uh, I have my things. I asked uh, Kobayashi Hiroto and a uh, young professor who is also a foreigner at K University. So Hirano san sees this like this. He says laboratories, quality of laboratories in long-term projects because students can see projects for three years. And then after that, if they continue PhD, it can go for another three years. Work closely with the professor. And it is, that is something that he says, and you will see in a moment, that cannot be done within the Western studio system. Students are not likely, to, on the negative side, students are not likely to be exposed to diverse methodologies. And shukatsu, job hunting, is a big problem. That is another story. That is another completely, completely separate story. And then he said, having experienced both laboratory system and the studio system in the US, where he did a PhD, he says, I admire both of the systems. However, I feel that there is still a lot to change in the lab system in Japan. So, Jorge Almasan. Jorge was hired when I came to Keio. He was hired to help me with English, with uh, Japanese, because he did his PhD in Tokyo, so he speaks very good, excellent Japanese. And Sejima was also finishing her contract, so he was helping Sejima and me. And then when Sejima left, we managed to keep her laboratory and make it Albazan Laboratory. So he's a young professor there, another Westerner, but of a completely different kind, because he speaks Japanese, his partner is Japanese, so it is a really completely different story. He also sees continuity of work, long-term research, but also place having a home at university, meeting discussions among students as very important things. I don't exaggerate. In Tokyo now it is uh, what it is, well, it is 1 a.m. But I am absolutely sure if I call my laboratory, some students will be there. And that's it. Do they work hard? No, Japanese in principle don't work hard. They spend lots of time at work. But that is about those bonds. That is about being among friends, about being am among peers. And you will see that in a moment. So. It is good about independence, freedom to develop own research lines. Students tend to accept continuing that. It is about acknowledging the character of the laboratory. But Jorge sees problems by saying some students become interested only in their own laboratory, very, very focused. Less opportunities, as Hirano san says, to, to know different professors' topics. And a risk of too early specialization. And that is really a risk. That is a very, very big risk. I like to encourage, to encourage students to go off. I was very proud of them who told me in his first year in my laboratory that he's interested in film. Now he's studying film. He's studying the, uh, the uh, film at Tisch in New York, and he just came back last month to Tokyo to tell me that now he studies film, but he's interested in architecture. 
So we will see what will happen with him in the end. But I like to support those schizophrenics. And of course, management. But this is what Kuma said, very interesting. Uh, he was very, very pointed at this question. And he told me it is about senpai and kohai culture. Senpai means earlier colleague, kohai means later colleague, which means older and younger member of the laboratory. And that is something which is about a lifelong relationship of interdependence. What happens, uh, Kuma told me, and this is really part of our coffee stuff, but I can share with you, he wouldn't mind. He says, because he was teaching at Keio and he was teaching at University of Tokyo, he was in a very famous Ushida laboratory, which was interdisciplinary. He said, uh, uh, CEOs of almost all Japanese development and construction companies came from Ushida laboratory. So he says, when I'm going to construction or development company, I'm going either to my senpai, to my senior, or to my kohai, to somebody to whom I can really, really say what he would do. And that is it. So, Uchida laboratory. And Kobayashi Hiroto added something third, monozukuri. And monozukuri literally means making things. And that is where Japanese are really good. With Kobayashi Hiroto last semester, uh, last September in the island, on the island of Vis in Croatia, we made this Japanese chashitsu, Japanese uh, tea ceremony building. Very small, prefabricated, uh, done by his prefabricated system after Tohoku earthquakes. So something that people can assemble without any skills. So very, very useful. But at the same time, it does possess certain aesthetic appeal. And it's very, very, it's very, very cheap. So Japanese uh, architects, Japanese students are addicted to making. And you can see that, for instance, this is Sana office or Sejima's corner in Sana's office. And I love each time when I go there to take a photo because this is not a storage. These are current projects. Everything is in making. Be before first sketch in Japan, in 99% cases, model comes. Model is a sketch. So making from the beginning is something very, very important, touching architecture. So that was Radovich sensei speaking. I can cut now, or I can go forever. <laughs> it is up to you. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, uh, okay. Darko, uh, thank you very much for this rich uh, lecture. Uh, perhaps we have time for one or two questions if you want, or Okay. Well, in this case, I, I invite uh, our director, Martin, to. Uh, oh, can't. No, no. I'm okay. We said we had to say. Yeah. Having time? Okay. Martin, please, uh, your final word of the, the journey. Thanks a lot. I would like just to, to thank our three uh, keynote speakers uh, Darko, uh, Lola Shepard, and uh, Richard Ingersoll. And uh, thank you all for what you uh, bring to the discussion today. And uh, perhaps before we, we, we leave and we go out for, for dinner, I would like to uh, make a special thank to uh, Ken Fitzsimons and, and Carlos Gottlieb. And perhaps we can uh, uh, applaud. <laughs> Thanks.